Hello, everyone. This is Robert Aceves, and I'm here with Neil Babbins. And we are here for another episode of MindFit. Thank you so much for coming back and listening to us. And today we are going to be talking about the five signs that you are in a toxic relationship. And we thought about this subject because it's something that I feel is important to know. And a lot of us, you know, who have relationships, sometimes we don't know when we are in a toxic relationship and sometimes it's not easy to see as well because we don't want to see it but you know we'll give you five signs today that might help you with that and before that how was your weekend yeah <laughs> weekend was really good thanks for asking i was at uh, a friend's house over the weekend watched some movies and played some games and um of course i went to D- disneyland as i always do on on That's Saturday, awesome. yeah. yeah, I love Disney. Mm-hmm. So, Me too. yeah, I was there on Saturday as well. So, and we got to see each other a little bit. So yeah. that was pretty cool. Yeah. All right. Well, um, let's see what the what is the first sign that you are in a toxic relationship? Well, according to um, this article that we're using, it says you always aim to please is number one. It says while well, you should aim to make your partner happy, it shouldn't take over your relationship. So if you're spending all of your time trying to perfect, to be perfect and being afraid of making mistakes, it could be a sign that the relationship is toxic. So um, always aiming to please. Yeah. So if you feel that, you know, um, if you make the slightest mistake that you'll be criticized for it or that something will fall out from under you or that you're not safe, you know, emotionally safe to do things that are not perfect or that, um, you know, leave you open to vulnerability with your partner then um, there, could, there could be a sign that you're not safe to be vulnerable in front of your partner. And then hence the connection is not really that strong. And um, that could leave you wide open for, uh, you know, for, for being attacked or bombarded in such a way. And um, I wanted to say that inside of all of these five things, that what tends to happen throughout all of them is that we tend to normalize a situation. We tend to, like you said in the introduction, we tend to either deny it's happening or we make it normal. We say, it's okay that it's happening. It's not a big deal. We sweep it under the rug or we feel it, but we're like, well, I'm used to it or it's not a big thing or I can deal with it or, um, you know, I don't deserve better. Maybe in a more toxic sense, we might say something like that or it's not great, but it's it's what I've got. You know, we sort of make all kinds of excuses for it. So we sweep it under the rug. So um, if you're always aiming to please, if you're always on guard to make sure that everything is perfect, that you're not caught in a mistake, um, you'd ask, might I, might ask yourself, how come, you know, how come if you do make a mistake, you do slip up or something's not 100% or 110%, what happens? You know, what do you fear will happen? Um, what will be said? What will be done? And, you know, how do you normally deal with that? Do you try to run away from it and make it better to fix it? Or do you allow it to be? And if you allow it to be, if you could be imperfect, you could also be vulnerable. And if you could be vulnerable, you could be connected. And that's the opposite to me of toxic. Right. Yeah. So here in this in this one, uh, our first sign, uh, it says, you know, you always aim to please what well, you should aim to make your partner happy. I feel like that is something that, you know, is important to make a note of because, you know, pleasing someone and trying to make them happy are two different things. Let's see if we can explain the difference. Mm-hmm. But um, I think that when you when they talk about aiming to please, you want them to you, you want them to love you. You want them to like you. And so you tend to do things that may not be healthy or not be good, good for you because, you know, you want them to, to be happy with you. So that could be some anywhere from like, you know, trying to lose weight because they may not like you because you're fat. Or if you want to make sure that they, you know, love you and you start wearing certain cl- types of clothes or you start, you know, doing things for them and that you don't like, but, you know, you want them you want them to, to feel happy with for you uh, or with you, I guess. And so and what it says, well, you should aim to make your partner happy, meaning, you know, how can you make them happy without trying to please them? And that is a good question. What do you think about that, Neil? <laughs> well, you know, you're right. I think there's a difference between making somebody happy and aiming to please. You know, aiming to please is uh, paying attention to somebody else's needs, to somebody else's um wants and values and uh, being concerned and being empathetic about how they feel and how something will land with them and checking in with them and finding out you know where they're at in communication but making them happy that's like being held at emotional gunpoint you know i use that term a lot in my work you know holding somebody else at emotional gunpoint how do i make you happy um i could aim to please you i could check in with you and find out what you need from me in order to feel safer to be at your best 
in some way, but I can't create that happiness. I can only create a situation or a space whereby you you could then walk into that own ha- your own happiness yourself. I could provide you with what you need from me in order to maximize your potential to be happy, but I can't make you happy, right? Nor can I really take your happiness away. I mean, I can if I become, you know, in the extreme position, become extremely abusive or something like that. But um, I think there's a very big difference between aiming to please, aiming to um, know what your your partner needs and um, being responsible or accountable for making them actually happy. Because sometimes they might be disappointed with you. It's okay to be disappointed with each other. You know, that's that's not something that has to be out of the equation for to have a health healthy relationship. Yeah. And I also think that the other person, you know, should give you f- the freedom to be you. You know, you don't have to change yourself to t- try to please the other person and to make them happy because, you know, you, you fit a certain mold that they want. Uh, and so this is important to keep in, in mind. Um, I, that doesn't mean that it's not right to also, you know, work on yourself and try to be a better person every day. It's just the difference between changing your, you know, who you are versus, you know, trying to still keep your your own identity, but, you know, uh, keep a, a healthy relationship. That's my opinion. Yeah. Identity is very important, too. You know, being able to uh, be together and yet individuals at the same time. You know, some people become right. too much of the we I mean, I mean, what's too much? I mean, I can't really say, but it's like, you know, subjectively. But um, absolutely, absolutely. Respecting, that's another thing that you might do to please each other is allowing independence, a certain amount of independence. You don't have to do everything together. You know, I've heard the famous relationship scientists, um, John and Julie Gottman, say that you don't necessarily have to have a lot in common. People think, well, we both have to like hiking or we both have to like... Uh, you know, going to Disneyland or we both have to like, uh, you know, whatever it is, off-roading. No, you don't. You don't have to have the same interests necessarily in order to have connection. It makes it easier because you're always together. But a lot of people are always together and are not really connected. So one thing does not necessarily have to do with the other. Just thought I'd throw that in. Good. All right. Well, the next thing, the next sign that we have is you are constantly criticized. So bickering, arguing are part of any relationship, but constant put downs and criticisms should not be accepted. Your partner is there to elevate you and make you the best person you can be, not the opposite. If you're constantly being criticized and not complimented, it may be time for you to leave. So um, now I, I personally, you know, don't believe in, in leaving a relationship because you're you're having all these issues. I feel like, you know, you can always fix them. But there are times when I think that it is important to keep this in mind, um, especially what what it says on this one that, you know, they constantly put you down. That is, to me, one of the, the biggest problems that, you know, toxic relationship could have, because like this thing says, the article says, you know, the, your partner should be there to elevate you, to make you a better person, to make you grow as you as you, you know, grow older with them. And when they're putting you down and, and making you feel like you're not worthy or that you're not, you know, a capable person of, of, you know, producing anything in life that you want, then I feel like that's that's definitely a big, big sign that that person, you know, could be a downer. And so, you know, it's important to keep that in mind. Also, you know, why are you there? Like, why is it, you know, why do you allow that person to put you down and, and work on those things? Because that's also something that we can have control over and, you know, know that if you don't, figure out why you're doing it now you might end up in another relationship later down the road with with this exact same problem so Mm -hmm. it's learning you know to set boundaries that we talked about before in the the last podcast and and many other different things so i don't know what you your thoughts are on this neil well i like what you said at the very end especially you know traveling from one position in life to the other from one job to the other from one relationship to the other from one location to the other you know what's in your suitcase is still in your suitcase when you when you arrive (laughs) you know unless you've dismantled it and taken it apart and looked at it so uh, oftentimes I see this all the time people get into a, a new relationship and they're all excited and happy and they're presented to you as a whole different you know category of person and if you know if you really observe the person is actually quite very much the same on the surface, they may appear different in a lot of different ways, but actually the, the interactions, the uh, subliminal interactions and the quality of the interactions are actually very much the same. So, um, yeah, um, being criticized constantly. A lot of people say, I criticize you because I want you to change. You know, um, a lot of parents say, I punish you because I want you to get better. The thing is that 
when you punish somebody, you increase levels of shame. When you criticize, you make them feel shamed for um, for what you're for what you're you know for what they've done or haven't done. And shame is always something that somebody has to take in and sort of process. So if you if you shame me, I have to be with my shame and all the hurt feelings about it, and then I have to turn around and think about what you said uh, or what what is it you need. But if you compliment me and um, if you lift me up that way, and then make a request. Right? You make a request saying, I really love the way you cook dinner. You know what would really be great? If we could have something with even more spice in it. Instead of saying, you know, your cooking is so bland. Right? Um, the way you come across, you know, the way you come across with your communication makes all the difference in the world. Because now mm-hmm. I don't feel shamed. Right? right. Mm-hmm. I feel happy. I feel heard. I feel appreciated. Mm-hmm. Very important to feel appreciated. I feel appreciated. I feel admired. I feel there's a certain fondness. And I have a request. You're making a request from from your partner rather than criticizing them. But again, I hear a lot of people say, and a lot of parents say, I say what I say to try to get them to be better. Yeah, how's that working out for you? That's what I see. You know? <laughs> that's, why, that's why you came to see me, you know? Right. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, and you know, the other day, a, f- a dear friend of mine was telling me that uh, she prefers when people tell her what they think. You know, I, I'd rather you tell me if you don't like something that I do or that I, you know, something that I have or you know, anything that, that you don't like, you know, rather people tell me straight up than, you know, them hiding it and, and holding it back, you know. So I was telling her, you know, I agree with that to a certain extent, because why, why not also mention all the good things that you do? Because I don't believe that everybody's, you know, a horrible person and everybody's doing things wrong all the time. I feel like we do a lot of good things throughout the day. And maybe we do one or two things wrong every now and then. So why not focus on only the positives and mention those positives and say the things that your kids are doing right, you know, say the things that they're doing correctly and and praise that and make them feel good, like, you know, more confident about the things that they're doing right versus like constantly nagging about the things that they're doing wrong and and telling them how bad they are at this or that. And, and, you know, just being honest, like they say, be honest about the positives as well. You know, tell people what you like about them, what you love about them. Mm -hmm. And if your partner is not doing that with you or for you, then that's a sign that you might be in a toxic relationship. So keep that in mind. Yeah, and it brings up the topic I, of, of self-soothing because um, in a relationship, it's important to know how to self-soothe. So a lot of people do a lot of nagging and a lot of criticizing mm-hmm. because they'll say, well, if I don't tell him, her, or whatever, that I, I'm that this is bothering me, how will they know to stop? And the thing is, you could, like I said, you could make a request, but a lot of the times that the nagging and criticism happens is because a person is unable to self-soothe, doesn't realize that, Someone else cannot be held accountable for the fact that you may feel disappointed or you may feel sad or you may feel afraid or you may feel vulnerable. Your partner is not necessarily responsible for making you feel not vulnerable, right? Um, If you um, do a lot of nagging, it's because you want something to change and you want something to change because whatever's happening is making you feel disappointed or sad. But I say self-soothing is about being able to be with a certain amount of sadness, even within a healthy relationship, certain amount of disappointment a certain amount of vulnerability, a certain amount of, and I don't just mean vulnerability that you use to connect with people. I mean vulnerability on your own, your own vulnerability. You know, even your own anger and frustration. You know, in, in a partnership, I'm not going to look to my partner and say, tell them everything that's going on with me. I take a step back, take a deep breath and say, is this something that I can self-soothe about or do I need to nag and criticize someone else to try to get all this to go away? So a lot of it is just about being with your feelings to a certain extent, and then not holding other people accountable for those feelings. And then sometimes, of course, you need to make requests of people. There are boundaries, there are limits. And, you know, knowing what those boundaries are. But if you catch yourself nagging a lot or criticizing a lot or being told you nag or criticize a lot, I want to take a step back and see how could I self-soothe. Maybe these are just very powerful, unpleasant feelings that I need to sometimes sit with inside a relationship instead of making my partner responsible for those feelings because that becomes what I think is toxic. Yeah, I totally agree. Cool. So what's the next one? You are never alone. Um, (laughs) Well, this says with social media and instant messaging, it is now easier than ever to know where your partner is. Well, this can offer peace of mind. Peace of mind. (laughs) Uh, Just call them. Um, It can also lead to control and manipulation. If your partner is constantly checking where you are, how long you will be, and doubting everything that you say. Well, actually, I think that line is a little different than the first two. Um, it can be a sign that they are becoming controlling. 
well, doubting what you say, it to me stands out from the other two. Like wanting to know where you are and how long you'll be. It's like, because, you know, maybe dinner's ready. I mean, um, you know, maybe the, the show starts at eight and it's 6.30 and they want to know where you're at. So it could be logistics. But if it's uh, doubting everything you say, that stands out to me as a little bit of a red flag. You know, if um, if somebody's doubting, you know, uh, doesn't trust, you know, where's that coming from? You know, what fear is that coming from? You know, um, I don't know if somebody was doubting me, I would kind of wonder what they're expecting from me, what they need from me, especially if I'm telling the truth, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If I'm not telling the truth or I haven't told the truth in the past, I can understand to some extent I'm afraid that maybe the pattern is repeating itself. But if somebody's constantly not trusting that I'm telling the truth, you know, it's almost like they need something from me that I cannot possibly provide. How many times can I tell you that it's the truth, right? And how many times can, uh, what do, I could show you my phone or whatnot, but if you're, you know those relationships where someone's always grabbing your phone and always looking at it, not that I've had those, I'm just saying, but, you know, <laughs> that they always want to see, you know, um, see for themselves. I mean, that, that does something to someone that, you know, a lack of trust, a lack of, um, you know, um, a lack of um, validation, you know, if you're just always grabbing my social media and taking a look at it like that. So I think that that does become toxic, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, the the biggest thing is to to see that, you know, like it says at the beginning of this, you know, you're not alone. Like you don't feel like you, you have your own space. And if they're constantly checking on you, you know, they, they might be suffering from FOMO, you know, fear of missing out. Mm -hmm. And they might just be wondering where you're at all the time. And, and I feel like what this refers to is when people are going to the extreme, like if you don't uh, tell them where you're at for five minutes or 10 minutes, then they might wonder a lot of things or, you know, like all the stuff you mentioned could be, you know, from past experiences and not necessarily with that person they could be from other relationships that they've had and they're just transferring those feelings and those doubts into this new relationship and so it's important to keep that in mind too like we've talked about in the past to be present and be present with that relationship and see where you're at with that person and also you know like it said with the social media it's so much easier nowadays to you know keep doing things uh you know with people like talking to them and being connected to people but the connection is not like you said it's not very real it's more virtual than actually just picking up the phone and calling them and, and you know connecting with them mm -hmm. so uh, it's hard to you know do things that are they, they call it alone together yeah exactly. alone together yeah <laughs> yeah there's a book about that actually yeah. oh nice yeah i had no idea yeah yeah <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, um, that, that's the thing is that if, if you have these doubts and you always have to check up on your partner, what I say is check in with what feeling it elicits inside of you to think that the possibility that your partner is not being faithful or is not around or is with somebody else or is not paying you attention. In other words, what feelings does that bring up in you? Is it feelings of sadness that you've had in the past? Is it feelings of disappointment or helplessness that you've had in the past or a fear of abandonment that you've had in the past? What I'm saying is that um, if you get in touch again with these feelings and allow yourself to feel them, allow yourself to have them, right? Mm -hmm. And not hold your partner accountable for not having them. <laughs> then you'll get to the root of the reason why you always want to know where they are and who they're with and when they'll be back. And, um, and then sort of after you blow up and have an escalation with your partner, then you sort of turn around and say, I don't know why I get so angry. I don't know why I get so controlling. You know, um, I don't know why I worry so much that the person's cheating on me. They've never done that. It's because if you take a look, you know, back in time, you'll probably see similar feelings you've had in the past that it reminds you of the possibility of losing somebody else's faithfulness or losing somebody else's attention. And um, it's really coming from that. It's not coming from your partner. You know, if it's coming from your partner, you may want to ask what it is that drew you to your partner if that's the kind of a person that's doing that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't know they were doing that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think the, the key on this one is control. You know, if they're becoming controlling and they're trying to 
control every single thing you do mm -hmm. and they won't even give you time to breathe and you know <laughs> go to the bathroom or shower and things wow, like that. Wow, what kind of relationship is that? Right? <laughs> I think that's I've it. I've yet to introduce that one. Yeah. Yeah. It, it happens. Really? Yeah, I've had people like that have come here and told me things like that. So, you know, that's why it's, it's good to have this information so you know, you know, because like you said at the beginning, you may be normal, it'd be normal, it might be normal in your relationship where you can't even go to the bathroom alone and you feel like that's just normal, but it's not. Yeah, you should be able to have your own space and have time to even go to the bathroom if that's what you need. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> I thought th certain things were taken for granted, but yeah. Uh, wow. Yeah. I'm curious about that. What's, yeah. Yeah, it, ha it happens. People, you know, have certain things because they, you know, they feel like some people feel like it's normal, that it's okay to, to go to the bathroom together or watch the other person in the bathroom, things well, like that. But I don't think it's... That's is. fine. <laughs> that's their thing. But, you know, what are you afraid they're going to do? Jump out the window and escape? I mean, right. you know, if you're, it's like if you're with a convict, I can understand, you know, you always have to watch them carefully. Like, what are they going to do if they're taking a shower? Right. You know? Well, some people are into that. No, that's, no, but that's not what you said. I mean, that's well, I know. Not, but that's, that's what I'm saying. What if you're not into that and then your partner is and, oh. you, and they really want to see what you're oh. doing? And so they won't leave you, okay, you know, alone. And then different. you feel, right. So you feel like you're being, you know, I see. Okay. manipulator, control, and, and you don't like it, but they have, they, they um, really want to do it. Like your partner has certain fetishes like voyeurism or <laughs> Maybe. whatnot. And you don't, and you don't feel comfortable telling them that you don't. Exactly. Oh, okay. All right. So, okay. That's right. kind of what I'm trying to say. But yeah. okay. <laughs> Use those I statements I talked about. Make some requests. You know, right. <laughs> I really love being intimate with you, but how about if we shower first and do it after, you know, or, yeah. or get a bigger bathtub, you know, or whatever, you know. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Because <laughs> I don't, yeah. Just make a request. Like, I, I, now I'm clear. Now I got what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. This actually leads into the next one, which is number four. Your needs are not being met. So relationships work both ways. So it's important that both of you feel valued and listened to. If your partner is not listening to your concerns, talking over you, or not valuing your desires and needs, it's time for you to call out your partner on your issues in, with a relationship. So it's important to know, you know, if your needs are being met, if you feel comfortable with how things are, and if they're not, to tell your partner and say, hey, you know, I don't like this. I, rather, I would really like to change it and make it uh, different. Or, you know, I don't feel valued. That's a big one because sometimes people, you know, take things for granted. They think that you just because you're there, then that's it. They, that's all they need. And it's not just being there physically. It's also mentally being there. It's also feeling like you're being valued by your partner, feeling like, you know, you deserve some attention, you know, at least three or four times a week or more than that, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I meant that with sex or other things that, you know, you might need, like, like maybe having dinner with your partner or lunch or, you know, going out and having dates here and there and, and just being, you know, feeling like somebody really wants you or needs you or, you know, those kinds of needs that are very, um, you know, deep that we all have that that we need that that extra person with us. And sometimes, you know, people might be in a relationship but not feel like their needs are being met and so it's important to keep it in mind yeah and some people their needs aren't being met and they don't even express what their needs are mm -hmm. and sometimes they don't even know what their needs are they just know something's not right mm -hmm. so really it's important to check in what are my needs what are my values and really what are my values you know mm -hmm. what are my values not the ones i was told i should have mm -hmm. and not the ones that your uh, you know your girlfriends or your your friend circle says you ought to have you know uh, what values and needs do you really have and are they being met and if they're not being met does your partner know they're not being met and is there a way to communicate what you need from your partner in a way that's appropriate in a way that's it's something that your partner could deliver upon do they even know mm -hmm. you know um, sometimes we get caught up in an argument or an escalation pattern and and we never even talk about the needs underneath it we just get into a, like a surface level argument that escalates because neither one's needs are being met and if we just stop and pull back and peel it away and we get to the what's underneath the core of what's going on underneath, we'll find out that needs are not being met. You know, there's some core emotions not being dealt with. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't mean you could you can necessarily give your partner everything that they need, but you could at least hear it and acknowledge it and know that it's what they need. Mm -hmm. You know, and then you could, you could meet somewhere in the middle. 
So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. There's one thing that says on here that it says, you know, talking over you. That's, I think that's huge for, mm-hmm. you know, when, in communications. I've had so many relationships that come here um, and couples that, you know, say that they don't feel like their partner listens to them, that they could be talking and trying to share something with someone and then they, you know, their partner just talks over them and it starts talking or says something or, you know, they're, you know, when they're t- trying to talk, they, they just get cut off. And so... Feeling like you can communicate and express yourself fully and and have someone listen to you, not just talk, talk, talk and not, you know, get the other person to listen. That is that's a huge need that I feel like it's important to, to know in a toxic relationship. You probably don't get that. You don't get somebody who listens to you. They they want to be heard, but they don't want to listen to what you have to say. And that's a huge red flag for me, I think, for uh, toxic relationships. Yeah. Again, it's if you have the urge to jump in and say something, you might want to check in as to what you're feeling underneath if you're you know reflectively listening to someone trying to and then all of a sudden you know or not all of a sudden you're you're actually prepared to say what you want to say and you jump in with that Mm -hmm. you know what makes you jump in with that what is right underneath there's a feeling of fear or something that you you won't get heard or that you'll get controlled you'll get smothered or you'll get engulfed by somebody else so you talk over somebody else but if you get in touch with the feeling underneath then you could tell your partner You know, sometimes I'm afraid I won't get heard. And, you know, you can't really argue with that. You know, sometimes I'm afraid of losing control. It's got nothing to do necessarily with what we're talking about, but sometimes I feel that I won't get heard or I won't get seen or, um, you know, I'll disappear. You Mm -hmm. know, if you can get in touch with whatever feelings make you jump in and talk over your partner, right, um, then you can get in touch with what's actually going on. And and conversely, if you um, have a partner that's always talking over you, you know, bringing it up to them in a way that's not about blaming them, saying sometimes, you know, I really want to say something and I feel that you want to say something so badly that you're not able to wait until I'm done. Can you tell me what that is? You know, what is it that makes you unable to wait for me to to finish? Are you afraid that I won't hear you? If you listen to me first and then speak, what if I give you a per- promise to give you a chance to speak as much as I've spoken when I'm done? You know, will you let me finish? What's there? What's happening? You know? And not everybody talks quite that way, but in your own words, checking in with each other, like what's going on underneath, you know, that's about connection, mm-hmm. but yep. rather than toxicity. Yep. I agree with that. Yeah. All right. What's the next one? The last one. Last one. Coercive control. Wow. Of course they left for the, for the end. Uh, part of being in a secure relationship is being able to feel free and enjoy yourself. However, if you are in a toxic relationship, this liberty may have been taken away from you. A red flag to look out for is whether your partner allows you to handle your own money and allow you to have financial security. If they handle the cash and only give it to you when you ask, warning signs should begin to flash. Okay, well. Uh, if they handle the cash and give it to you only when you ask, well, at least they're giving it to you. <laughs> I mean, you know, I was like, that line kind of contradicts there a little bit. But um, I guess who controls the money has a lot to do with um, interactions in a relationship, both toxic and, and healthy, right? Because sometimes there is a very big uh, um, difference, you know, um, between who's earning and who's not. And sometimes that fluctuates in a relationship too. When they first got together, you know, they're both earning incomes and one person stops either to take care of the kids or to, uh, you know, because they move to a different location. I noticed that a lot in relationship counseling. A lot of changes happen. And the financial relationship as a result changes. And sometimes people have to deal with a lot of emotions, a lot of esteem loss Mm -hmm. when they were once earning a lot of money, even more than their partner. And now they're not earning anything or nearly as much because of shifts and transitions in 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 the home. So um, if you're in a toxic relationship, yeah, I mean, that's one way. I think what this is saying is that's another uh, manifestation or symptom of control and of toxicity and of not being, not trusting your partner, feeling that you have to control the situation because of uncomfortable feelings that might come up if you don't control it. And money is definitely, definitely, speaking from personal experience, a way of doing that, of uh, avoiding uncomfortable feelings by controlling other people. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's a big one. Money is huge. Yeah, I think think that one of the biggest things that this 
tells you is you know the other person wants to control everything you do and so the best way like you just mentioned to control someone is through money because that's the one thing we have to be able to do the things that we want to do in life sometimes and you know when you make your own money but then you you share it with your partner but then they don't give you the access to it that is is where it becomes a, an issue you know because as a as a couple you you should be able to both have access to the money because both of the money that the other person makes and you you make belongs to both of you now if if the other person is you know keeping it and only giving you what you need whenever you need it that's you know it's 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 good but if you want something if it's not a need and you just want to buy something you know whatever that's that's where it shows you know if they if they allow you to buy something that you really want or if they want to control that and tell you you know what you can't do that because you know we need the money blah blah blah, blah. you know th there could be a reason for that but at the same time you know is it really that reason or is it the other person just trying to control you you know are they just trying to make sure that you don't do things that you want to do because they're afraid that you might leave them or that you might meet somebody else or other hidden reasons that are not you know open so when they're trying to control everything you do not just with money i mean this is also with the things that you do like the things you want to take like if you want to go to school or learn something or you know if you want to do something at your house or or travel somewhere and the, your partner doesn't want to do it you know if they won't do it but they won't let you do it that is where I think is the problem so I don't know what you think about that yeah one thing that came up one question that came up that you could ask uh, around the area of money for example to find out um, what the root of the toxicity is is you could ask a question to the person who has the money or who's distributing the money let's just say I'd say to that person let's say your partner the one who doesn't have the money suddenly came into a lot of money or suddenly started making a million dollars a year suddenly had the very thing that you're providing for them what do you fear would change in this relationship in this dynamic what do you think would change almost overnight what do you fear would happen if the person had control over their own money or um even over yours but just had a lot of money and usually if you peel it away there's like you'd said earlier um, there's there's fears of you know what might happen if a person has access not just to the money but to freedom has the sense of security doesn't need you is no longer dependent upon something that you provide for them and what you actually provide for them if you peel it away is actually connection they want to be with you you want to be with each other you want to be with each other not only because you're good company but because you provide something emotionally for each other not because you need to be with each other Right. So I'd ask someone, you know, e on either end of the spectrum, if you're being controlled, or if you're doing the controlling, what do you fear would happen if that L if that interaction was not there? If that person had their own money or if you had your own money, would you be with this person? You know, the person who's being controlled financially. I said, mm -hmm. what if you came into a lot of money? What if you started making a lot of money? Would you still be with this person? And how would the dynamic change? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, I always ask hypotheticals. I say, you know, Socratically, what if that wasn't the case? What if it was the opposite? What would you start to feel, you know? So that sort of opens the, uh, you know, opens the door to the basement, so to speak. And you can see the root of it. Yeah. You know, because, yeah, money's never about money. Money's yeah. always about something else. Yeah. Yeah. Now, these are just some signs that tell you that you're in a toxic relationship. I'm sure there are a lot more. So maybe we don't didn't mention all of them, but you know this gives you an idea. And I think one of the biggest things that I, I would say is important is your your emotion and how do you feel? You know, your state of mind. Do you feel happier with that person? Do you actually feel like you're growing spiritually? You feel like every year your life is improving, or do you feel like your you know your life is going down the drain and you feel down most of the time? You're starting to get depressed and and feel like you don't have you know freedom to do the things you want to do freedom to think for yourself those are all signs that that you know will tell you if you're in a toxic relationship or not and now that doesn't mean that your relationship cannot improve like there are things you can do to improve together if, if the other person is willing to do it so that's another thing you know if they're willing to work with you and work on all these things to make your relationship better it, there is a way to get healthier and better and that's why you need help and you need to go to a person who knows how to help people or you know relationships which is one way of doing it another way is to figure out what works for you and and try to work on that and 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 do that you know because everybody's different so i feel like 
uh, you know, we all have to look for the things that work for us. Now, this article was uh, written by Diana Simpson, and it's called The Five Signs That You Are in a Toxic Relationship. Um, I will put the link on the description. So if you're interested in reading it more, it's basically all the stuff we just said. And um, any last thoughts, Neil, before we end? Um, yeah, if you um, feel that you're in a toxic relationship um, and you are feeling smothered by that, uh, take a step back and ask yourself, um, you know, if you've if you've made it normal, if, if you normalized it somehow, or is there really something, you know, going on here? Um, yeah. That's what I would say. I would say check in. Check in with yourself. Because a lot of times when you're in a toxic relationship, you don't recognize that it's toxic, you know, until you break away from it or until you peel it away and see what's actually going on. You don't realize that you're living your life in a toxic environment or toxic relationships because you've made everything around you completely normal, completely familiar. So if it's familiar, you feel there's there's nothing wrong anymore. In fact, it's familiar, so it must be okay. But got to ask yourself certain hypotheticals. How do you really feel? You know, how do you really feel here? Is this really okay? What do you need that you're not getting? What did you always need that you're not getting? What did you make normal that isn't normal for you? And when I say normal, I don't mean, uh, you know, abnormal. I just mean it's not okay. Yeah. It's not okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time, Neil. And thank you all for listening. Remember, we're here every Tuesday at 6 p.m. on any of the platforms that you listen to your podcast. Uh, please send us your comments, questions. We appreciate them. And remember, we are also on Facebook and Instagram. So if you have more questions or things you want us to talk about, please do let us know. And thank you to all the people that are now listening to us and the people that support this podcast. We really appreciate your help. And thank you so much for everything. Yeah, thank you. This podcast is brought to you by MindFit. Please help us to share this podcast with your friends and family to grow this community. And if you'd like to donate to this podcast, or if you'd like to share your comments, questions, or concerns, send them to mindfitpodcast at gmail.com, or you can call us directly at 714-328-4661.